And so as I always do during December, I wait upon the Lord for a theme for the next year. And during 2014, our theme was, was entitled Breakthrough. And as the Lord showed me, many of you have experienced breakthrough in your lives. You know, through 2014, God has been working in your life. You may not realize that you have had that breakthrough. But the Lord showed me that in 2015, a lot of those breakthroughs are, are going to need restoration in 2015. <coughs> so this is a year of restoration. And this morning, we are going to look at a process for biblical restoration and healing. And then in the next three to four weeks, we're going to focus on prayer to receive that restoration. Because see, first and foremost, the restoration has to start with us. And how does that start with us? By our prayer life. It's not by coincidence that the Lord has started off this year with a week of prayer and fasting. It's not a coincidence the Lord has said, okay, I want you to read the Word of God for, you know, for, for uh, 14 days. Uh, and then he follow, following that up um, after the, went, um, with a, a, a four-hour prayer retreat here at the church. Again, this is all important for what God is intending to do in his church. And so for those of you that have brought your Bibles, open up to the book of Joel, chapter number 2, verses 25 to 27. Joel chapter 2, 25 to 27. The word of the Lord says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the, and the palm worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. You see, that's the Lord's desire upon our hearts. That this, He was talking here about restoring Israel, but here he's talking about restoring each and every one of us. Maybe for the years of things that have happened in our lives, that he is going to restore them in 2015. And my message is entitled, God's View on Restoration. God's View on Restoration. Let us pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you today. And we just thank you. We thank you for your word that you just shared with us out of, out of the book of Joel. Father, how your heart's desire is, is to restore us. Restore us in every aspect of our life. So that we will never be ashamed of anything. But that we'll continue to give you praise and glory for the fruit of what you're doing. And so this morning, Holy Spirit, we invite you to minister to each and every one that are here. Speak to their hearts this morning. If some of them are struggling in, in areas of their lives, Father, we pray that you're going to show them how you're going to restore them. Maybe they've already been restored and they don't know it, but you're going to show them that also. And I pray and I ask, Father, that the words I speak this morning will come directly from your heart. Clear out my mind from anything that I may have to say, and I want to hear from you to share your heart with the church today. We love you and we thank you as we start year 2015, 
the year of restoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Failure among God's people is nothing new. Biblical history is littered with it. Samson failed. Abraham failed. Solomon failed. Jonah failed. The Hebrews failed. All of the 12 of the disciples of Jesus failed. Even King David, who was a man after God's own heart, failed. And look in 2 Samuel, chapter number 11, verse number 27. 2 Samuel 11, verse 27. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. We all know that the story of, of David and Bathsheba. So I don't, need to, I don't need to go down there. But here we have a, a great man of God that the Bible says that had a heart that God, God just loved. But for whatever reason, sin entered into his life. And sin destroyed that what he had at that particular moment. But as we continue to read in, in, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and, and through the Old Testament, it shows about how David, how David got restored. How David humbled himself before the Lord and, and asked the Lord for forgiveness. And that forgiveness was granted. And then God raised him up to be one of the greatest kings in biblical time. A great man of God throughout the Old Testament. And so it's so important for each and every one of us to understand that wherever we are in our life, how God will restore us. You may be here this morning, and, and you might not even know Jesus. I'm here to let you know that when you, when you open your heart and you receive Jesus, then he's here to restore you. I look at my life over 22 years ago of how God, I was at that pit. I mean, I knew, enough about, I knew enough about Jesus, but I didn't know him personally. And how he had reached down to that miry pit and how he pulled me out and how he set me upon his rock and how he has restored my life in an incredible way. And along my journey with him over the, <coughs> the 20-plus years I've been serving God, it hasn't been all a bed of roses. There's been bumps and, and glitches that I've had. But God continues to restore and, and build up and, and continue to work in our lives. So don't give up this morning. If you're here this morning and maybe there's situations and circumstances that are going on in your life, don't give up. David never gave up. Samson never gave up. The disciples never gave up. None of them gave up. Because, see, God doesn't give up on us. He continues to love us. He continues to walk with us. He continues to open doors that, that no man can ever open for us. And he can raise us all up to a point where wherever we go, people are just at totally at, at you know, drawn to you, you know, and it's, it's truly a blessing how God does things in our lives and the favor that we have in the eyes of man. And I know on Friday I was getting my, my leg done and, and some of the nurses, are, <laughs> there was about three of them, they were all standing there because they're all, they can't believe what God, is, what how over the last week, just how fast the healing has happened. And uh, one of them, two of them said, we're going to miss you. We're going to miss you. And I said, well, I said, I'm just down the street. I said, you can come in and have a coffee with me. 
or I can come in and have a coffee with you. But I said, I'm not going to be out of your life. God has done this and arranged it for a purpose. I didn't say this to them, but I, I just said, I'm always going to be here. You know, and, and that's what God does. The favor that God gives us um, as, he, as he uses us in, in, in different ways of life. But you see, the evidence is that God is in the restoration business. Throughout the, word of, throughout the Word of God, it's astonishing record of the Lord's efforts to reclaim and to restore those who are eternally His. Restoration is more than mending broken hearts and bringing closure to sad characters in life. It is, ref, it is refusing to surrender any of heaven's own to hell's work. Restoration is focusing on God's priorities, not ours. Restoration cannot be produced by forms. That is never enough. It can be provided only when hearts are ruled by God. And I really love and respect Margot, and, and Margot um, was praying for the church a few weeks ago. And as last year, the Lord gave her a vision and a word for the church. And so I asked her to, to uh, print it out for me. And it says, 2015, a year of birthing and miracles. As I have been praying for the vision of the dwelling place, the Lord dropped in my spirit that this coming year would be a year of birthing and miracles. Upon asking the Lord for clarity on this, I believe he spoke very specifically. The year of birthing. This will be a year in which the Lord will be showing his children many things. And we as his children will be birthing visions, prophetic words, and he will be healing us in many areas. Along with birthing, there will be, there will be pain. But if we persist and keep our eyes on him, he will show us great things. He has great plans for his body in this city. He has not forgotten all the prayers that have gone up. <coughs> Excuse me. And he will answer them in his timing. We will feel labor pains as we give birth to the many things he will be showing us in the coming days. Are you ready to keep your focus and eyes on him? He will be asking many things of us, and some will be unusual, and we may even wonder is this from him? He will make it very clear to us. The second part of it is the year of miracles. This was very exciting to me. And as I was seeking him, I believe that he will, he will do wonders like we have not seen. He is alive and well in this city. Many souls will be saved. Many people will receive healing in their bodies and minds. Many people will be delivered from their addictions and will be evangelizing throughout this city. We will see limbs grow, ears open, and many other signs and wonders. This will take place for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. He will give us dreams and visions, an interpretation of dreams and visions. The prophetic will once again come alive, and those who have never prophesied will begin to speak the wonders of God. He has cautioned us to continue to see <coughs> see his face and not his hand. When trouble comes, we need to press into him like a child presses into his mother's bosom. He will always see us through hard time. We will see financial miracles as well. He says you cannot outgive him. He will lay it on the hearts of man to give. Some will give and not even know him. They will see his wonders and know that he is God. He will not be able to take the credit for his work because it will be miraculous. God will be asking what we might think to be a lot, but he wants to reveal himself to us. Are you ready? This seems to be a question he's asking over and over. Are you ready to trust him fully in every area of our, of our lives? That means he wants to be our friend. Seek his face and not his hand. Seek his presence and not what he can do. Seek ye first the kingdom. And all these things 
shall be added unto you. Hang on, because we're in for a fantastic ride in 2015. We are truly blessed and highly favored. And so important for us to be sensitive to what God wants. And I really appreciated Larry Sims. Larry came to prayer on Tuesday. And one of his prayers was, Lord, I just don't want to seek your face. I want to seek all of you. I want to seek all of you. You see, and that needs to be our, our heart's desire. It's to not only seek just the face of Jesus, but to seek all that Jesus has for us. See, as that prophetic word that was spoken over my life for 2015, unlimited supply, unlimited power. You see, that's seeking all of Jesus. That's seeking all of Jesus. So be encouraged this year, church, as, as God continues to, to take us through a whole new walk with him, a whole new area that God is launching off and, and, and taking us into. That I know that, that, that our church is, is, is going to just to, to grow and to grow and to grow. And this morning in my prayer time, actually here at the church, I said, Lord, that vision that you gave me when I first got called to this church as intern pastor. See, the first Sunday I was here, I was walking up and down the aisles praying for, the, praying for all the seats. And I looked, opened my eyes and I looked, and the Lord gave me a silhouette of both the top, the bottom and the top being totally full. Well, seating capacity in our church is 350 people. You see, so God is showing us what his intentions are. And as he continues to fill his church, we're going to be out of the norm of everything, of every other church, of every other city. Because every other city, the population, you know, 10% of the people in the in of the population of that church go to, or other, of that city go to church. Well, if we can get 350 to start coming to our church and to fill the sanctuary, we're going to be truly blessed. And God, people are going to wonder what is going on at the dwelling place. So today we're going to look at five areas of restoration the Lord has shown me for our church body. The first one we're going to look at is physical rest, physical restoration. We're going to look at two, two scriptures. The first one is in Jeremiah, chapter number 30, verse number 17. Jeremiah 30, verse 17. And it says, For I will restore, I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion whom no man seeketh after. Again, I want to read the first part of it. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Well, you see, that was the same prophetic word that, that the Lord gave Margo, that he is going to heal the wounds of each and every one of us and heal our health. And then go over to the book of Mark, chapter number 8, verses 22 to 25. Mark chapter 8, 22 to 25. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they be, there being a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he, if he says aught. And he looked up, and he said, I see, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hand again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into thy town, nor tell it to any in the town. You see, why did Jesus touch the man a second time before he could see? 
This miracle was not too difficult for Jesus. But he chose to do it in stages, possibly to show discipline that some healing would be gradual rather than instantaneous, or to demonstrate that spiritual truth is not always perceived clearly at first. And as I've mentioned many times, before the Lord gives me a message, he usually walks me through it. And if you can remember, almost well, 68 days ago, I said that there, the Lord has something that he wants to show through this journey he's got me on. Well, you see, today is that physical restoration. Because you see, we continue to pray. We continued to believe that God was going to restore me. We never, you know, I never doubted it. I mean, at times I, I had got those little pity parties. Oh, Lord, why, you know, why haven't you done it? Why haven't you done it? And I could see as I was pre preparing for this message today, why all of a sudden on New Year's Day, I was able to put a shoe back on. Why on New Year's Day, I've got just a, a couple little areas that, are, that need, need the attention from home care and nursing. The rest of my leg is being restored. I'm putting lots of cream on my leg now to keep it from drying out. But you see, that's the progression of God's healing. The same thing as what he did with that blind man. Why he touched that blind man twice. Because at times... There's healing that takes time. It just doesn't happen instantaneous. But you see, I also experienced that in instantaneous healing about, well, seven years ago now, when I was with, traveling with Prayer Canada, the same time that it opened up the recovery center, I also went across Canada uh, with Prayer Canada. And I'll never forget this. I was in, I was in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and I was doing the ministry time and praying over people, had words for people. And then the pastor of the church prayed for me, and he says, God is going to perform a miracle on you somewhere in this journey. Well, that miracle happened in Welland, Ontario. Because in Welland, Ontario, I took sick. And to make a long story short, I was in a hotel room, and I was passing out. And finally, I, I, they, call, I called, they asked them to call me an ambulance. They wheeled me into the, into the emergency room at the Welland, uh, Welland Hospital. And they took me upstairs and did the x-rays. And the specialist come and told me, he says, he says, Mr. Short, he says, you're dehydrated. And I said, well, no, I said, I'm not dehydrated. He said, yes, you are. He said, your liver and your kidneys are ready to shut down because you're bleeding internally. But you see, I'd, I'd had, I'd had a check, I'd had checkups before. You know, my doctor is very thorough, and you know, n there was no signs of any of this stuff that, you know, going on. And he says we're going to. He said you have a problem with blood transfusions, and I said no, not a problem. And at that time, there was some things going on in Toronto. Uh, with a certain denomination about blood transfusion. I said, no. I said, I don't have a problem with that. He said, well, we're scheduling you for blood transfusion. I said, great. And so as he left, they closed the curtain, and they turned off the light. That whole room illuminated in the presence of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to me, he says, I am healing the inside of your stomach. And the blood that they're giving you is the blood of, of, of Jesus Christ. It's pure and holy. Take as much as they're willing to give you. And total peace came over me. They started the blood transfusion. A couple days later, I was scheduled for a scope. And for those of you that have scopes, they're not, they're not nice. But all I could hear as I was in the getting the scope done was the specialist saying, 
I can't see anything. I can't see anything. I can't see anything. After about a half an hour of him with this thing down my throat and going through and trying to find anything, they pull it out and, and they say, we'll have a report for you later on. And he comes up to my room. And he says, Mr. Short, he says, I don't know what happened, but he says, I had the before showing us all the contusions and where the, where the leakage was happening with the blood. But he says, those are all gone now. And I know that Jesus had healed me instantaneously. But you see, this healing was progressive. The same thing with my wife. I've been praying for 20 years for God to restore my wife. Not, and as, as I was doing this praying, you know, God was doing things in me. There was things in my life that God needed to deal with, to restore. I'll never forget one of them, and some of you have already heard this. But the Lord's prompting me. You know, my wife's family took, my wife's mother took sick, and she was flying back to New Brunswick. And I take her to the internet, the Calgary airport, and as she's, busy shuffling, shuffling along to go through security and on the plane. The power of God come all over me. And I was figuring, man, I'm gonna, my wife's going to be gone for about a month. I'm gonna, what, a, what a respite I'm going to have. What a, what a rest I'm going to have. Well, there I am, a grown man in the middle of the Calgary International Airport, weeping uncontrollably for my wife. She hasn't even left the city of Calgary, and I'm missing her. And I've got about eight weeks of this to go through. And I'm walking out of the international airport, and the tears are flowing down, and I'm sitting in my, van, my vehicle, and the tears are weeping, and I go home to my mom and dad's place, and, and I'm just going, I, to, I said to them, I don't know what's going on. But I said, I miss Bonnie already. And a couple weeks later, I did a wedding. And I said to them, to, I said to them, I said, family is so important. You need to make sure that you put your wife first and foremost in your life. We see, that was one thing that God needed to deal with me on. Because at that particular time, my life was God, ministry, and family. And from that day forward, it was God, family, ministry. So that was a situation that God needed to restore in me. There was other situations through, I mean, I could be here all day just talking about the things that God has dealt with me in regards to my wife. Patience is another one. God continues to deal with that. But now, he's starting to restore my wife. He's starting to, that part of her brain that was damaged because of of the, of the radiation in regards when her bladder gets full. Now she knows she needs to go to the bathroom. And she gets up and she goes. God is starting to restore her. But he had to deal with me first. <laughs> I'm a little slow at times. And it took him almost, you know, 20 years to get me to that point. But again, it's a process that God takes us through on physical restoration. So if you're here this morning, and maybe you've been struggling with healing that hasn't happened in your life, well, maybe it's possibility that God is, there's a reason behind it all. God has a plan. God has a plan for each and every one of us. But again, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Continue to believe that God is going to restore your health 100% physically as he continues to do with me, as he's doing with my wife. And again, so physical restoration is a process that God wants to take us through. But as he does, we become stronger because of it. The next one I want to look at is family restoration. Mark eleven twenty-seven 
22 to 24. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he has said shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. God will answer your prayers, but not as a result of your positive mental attitude. Other conditions must be met. God continues to, as we continue to pray and believe that God is going to restore families. I mean, I see it happening in, in the recovery center. You know, part of our logo for Wings as Eagles is God brings families together who are worlds apart. But it's a process that God takes us through. But we have to continue to pray and, and, and not give up in prayer saying, saying, Lord, continue to heal that relationship. Restore that relationship I, need, I, I desire with my family. One of the most scary things for me when I was in jail was that something drastic would happen to my mother or my father or any one of my family members, that any one of them would pass away while I was incarcerated. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, protect my family. Protect my family. And for nine months while I was incarcerated, he protected my family. He gave me that opportunity when I got released to start restoring my relationship with my family. I'll never forget Reverend Ray Parker, who was a prison chaplain at the time. On the day I was being discharged, he said to me, he says, Ron, he says, take these words, these, heed these words. He says, don't force anybody's hand. When you start forcing families' hands, they're going to push you away. Continue to keep your eyes on Jesus. Seek his face, as Margot said, in the word that she had for the church. And God will continue to not only work in you, but work in your family. First, of, first restoration was my, with my relationship with my wife. Because here I am, you know, she's sick. I'm off in jail. I get home. And for one solid year, I slept on the couch. But I, and I didn't, I never forced her hand. I never said, well, Bonnie, look, look what, look what, look, I've changed, I've changed, I've changed. I just let God continue to do the changes that he needed to do in me the changes he needed to do in my wife. Then there was that one day where she said, you can come, you know, come, come back into the bedroom. God had restored that relationship with my wife. It took that relationship with my parents almost four years. I continued to pray and, and say, Lord, restore that relationship I, I, I desire with my dad and my mom and my brother and, and my family. And I'll never forget it. It was four years after. And my mom and my dad had come for a visit. At the time, my dad was able to golf, and we went to Mission Hills, and, and we teed off on the second hole. And we're walking down after we teed off. And he looked at me, and he says, Ron, he says, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of what you're doing in your life. Just like what he said in January, on New Year's Day. Ron, I'm proud of you. You see, God restored that. I didn't try to do anything. I just kept believing that God was going to restore it. Same thing with my sister. How God restored my relationship with my sister, with our whole family. My sister was, uh, has been the black sheep of the family. But it, what it took to restore my sister to the family was my mother's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and my mother passing away. And I remember so vividly, I just dropped the, the guys off at, at the superstore to get some groceries. 
and I'm turning around in my car, and my cell phone rings. It's, it's my sister. And I've been praying this. And she says, Ron, she need, said, we need to put the past behind us. And because of mom, we need to make reconciliation. You see, God restored that relationship with my sister. I was listening to a message earlier this week by Pastor Jim Simbla from, from Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. And he was saying about his daughter and how his daughter had fallen away and had, had gone astray from the family and was living in the world. And he never quit praying for his daughter. Him and his wife kept praying and praying and praying. And they kept the communications line open with their daughter. And then one day God said to him, he says, I want you to stop praying for you. I want you to quit communicating with your daughter. And him being obedient to what God said, he, he, quit, he quit. He quit communicating with her, but he kept praying. Then one night they were having a prayer meeting at the church. And the Lord spoke to him and some other people. And he said, God is going to restore your relationship with your daughter. The next morning he gets up and he's in the, in the washroom and he's getting himself ready to go to, you know, go to the church office. And his wife comes upstairs and she's crying. She says, Jim, you need to come downstairs. Our daughter's there. He says, I come down the stairs. He said, I had shaving cream on my face. And he says, my daughter's on her knees, weeping before God, asking God for forgiveness. And then she comes to me and she says, Daddy, please forgive me. Please forgive me for what the kind of daughter I was. And then he, she goes to his mother, her mom, and says, Mom, please forgive me. You see, God restored the family. So again, the power of prayer. Don't quit praying. Continue to pray. Continue to believe. And remove any selfish desires or selfishness out of it. It's between you and God. But God will restore your family. And be prepared and be expected that in 2015, God is going to restore all of our families. All of our families. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap this morning. That's his, that's, he says that. It's a year of restoration. And he just spoke that through my heart this morning. The next restoration I want to look at this morning comes out of business restoration. Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. Verse number 10. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. You see, for those of you that are business owners, or for those of you that are in the business community, God is going to restore your businesses. God is going to double, double what you may have lost in your business. So for those of you that are working for retail outlets, walk in belief that whoever you're working for, God is going to restore that business. God is going to make that business stronger. For those of you that have your own business, believe that this is going to be an incredible year of restoration in your business. That God is going to continue to double, double what you may have lost. God is going to restore your business without a shadow of a doubt. But again, it gets back to what Job did and how Job prayed for those friends that came against him and how God, how God then blessed Job with twice as much. So you can see the link of where we're going with 
this year of restoration and how important prayer is. So I'm encouraging all of you in the business, you know, that are working, that are part of business, to continue to pray. Don't give up. Don't give up. And things may have failed in your business, but God is going to restore that with an incredible blessing that God will bless you with. The next point I want to talk about is financial restoration. Look in the book of Luke, chapter number 6. Luke chapter 6. Oh, pardon me, Luke chapter 16. Sorry. Luke chapter 16. Verses 19 to 24. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his feet at the gate of a full of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the, the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and, and licked the sores. And it came to pass that the, the beggar died and was carried by his, the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he, he lifted up his eyes, being in, in, in torment, and, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You see, the Pharisees considered wealth to be a proof of a person's righteousness. Jesus startled them with this story in which a diseased beggar is rewarded and a rich man is punished. The rich man did not go to hell because of his wealth, but because he was selfish, refusing to feed Lazarus, take him in or care for him. The rich man was hard-hearted in spite of his great blessings. The amount of money we have is not as important as the way we use it. What is your attitude towards your money and possessions? Do you hoard them selfishly or do you use them to help others? You see, it's so important, so important for us to trust in God in all of our finances. And how important it is for us to give God what is rightfully His. What rightfully belongs to God, we need to give to Him. And that is 10% off the top. We need to give to God's kingdom. And then whatever else you give, God will continue to bless you and bless you and bless you. I look at what God has done for me, you know, in, in my life and how God continues to provide for me. I am better off financially today than I have ever been. You look at, you look at my bank account and it doesn't show that. But I'm far more richer financially, in the, and God continues to bless us, continues to provide for us. Those seven, the six years, or actually five years that I was in full-time ministry with just Wings as Eagles, how God continued to meet all of our needs each and every day. Then how God blessed me when I you know, came here to the dwelling place. How God continues to bless us financially. But we have to realize that it belongs, everything belongs to God. None of us own anything. Doesn't matter how many funerals I've done, I've never ever done a gravesite where they, they take it all of the wealth of that individual and buried it with them. We need to realize that God wants to restore us financially. How do we do that? By willing to give into his kingdom. Bless his church. Bless those that do kingdom ministry. Because God will pour out his blessings upon you. His word tells us that. His word tells us that in Malachi. Test me. Try me. And so this year, this year God is going to restore each and every one of us financially. You may be on the brink of of receivership, you may be on the brink of bankruptcy, the Lord is telling you to hang on. <coughs> hang on. 
Seek my face. Seek counsel. And I'm going to restore you financially in 2015. So again, believe it. Hang on to it. Trust it. Because those are God's blessings. And that's the word from the Lord, he says, in financial restoration. The last one I want to talk about this morning is spiritual restoration. It comes out of the book of Psalm, chapter 50, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. First 12 verses. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my inequities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only, have I sinned, done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in inequity, and in this and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou dearest, desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face, hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my inequities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy spirit. You see, we have, and earlier this morning I talked about David's plea. David's plea to be restored by God. And this is his, this is his, this was his prayer. This is his prayer to God. God's mercy for forgiveness and cleansing. God wants our hearts to be right with him. See, it's God's heart's desire that each and every day he creates a clean heart within us. Each and every day, it's the Father's heart to renew that spirit within us. Each and every day, he wants to restore the joy of thy salvation. So if you're walking, you know, if you're here this morning and maybe you're struggling spiritually, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you this morning that God will restore you. God will deal with those issues in your life that maybe have, are hurt, hindering you. And God will raise you up and so that your testimony can be an example for somebody else. My journey has not been easy. There's been times where I've had little glitches, little bumps. But I look at Psalm 51, verse 10. And I cry out, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Restore that right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And that's what we each need to do each and every, when we feel that happening. We need to cry out to God. We need to ask God to restore us spiritually so that we can walk with freedom in his kingdom, so that we can soar like an eagle in his kingdom. So that he can be, we, he can continue to pour out his blessings upon us. That's the Father's desire upon his heart, is for us to be restored spiritually, so that we can walk in the boldness and in the love. I mean, you just look at what the world is all about. I mean, you look at what's happened already in the year 2015 of of all the, <coughs> even in the province of British Columbia and Alberta all of the deaths, all of the gunslings, things that have been going on, this world's a mess. But God wants to restore us. God wants to make us better. So as we look back, in closing this morning, as we look back at our opening scripture in Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, it is God's intentions to restore to each of us those things in our lives that have been taken from us. Physically, family, business, finances, and spiritually. When the Lord walked you through the breakthrough in 2014, 
He's going to restore in 2015. So as Joel chapter 2, verse 26 says, so you will be satisfied and praising the name of of the Lord our God. And as we close the service this morning, I'm going to ask Aaron to play this song by the Gaithers. And it's, Why me, Lord? Why me? And you may be here this morning and, and you're saying, Why me, Lord? Why have I gone through this? Why have I gone through all of these, these things and, and, you know, you've dealt with things in my life, but why me, Lord? And I say, I, sh I ask the Lord that all the time. I say, why me, Lord? Why did you choose me and do what you've done in me? And I just love him because of it. And so as this song is being played this morning, just let the, the words minister to you. Why me, Lord?